wanted to talk about um, these two topics. I wanted to talk about data management and data governance and what we've put in place um, across the cardiac center at CHOP. Before I get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor about our background and so I think you can um, see some of the things uh, or, or help understand why we did some of the things and, and the way we did it. Um, and then hopefully, um, or, or my plan is to leave some time at the end for any uh, questions or, or conversation that you want to have um, afterwards. So uh, let me go ahead and jump right in, uh, give you a little bit of black background of a flavor um, of, of, of who the cardiac um, patient is. And this will give you, I think, a little bit um, better understanding of our data and, and how we're thinking about um, you know, things in the cardiac center. So uh, congenital heart disease, otherwise known as CHD, number one birth, de birth defect in the U.S. Approximately one out of 100 to 100, 120 babies are affected, um, were born with CHD. That, that represents about 30 to 40,000 uh, diagnoses each year. Uh, cardiac uh, or congenital heart defects are the number one cause of a birth, de birth defect related uh, deaths. So those two facts um, pretty much tell you that we're looking at a, a large population. The, the next two, um, the next two uh, bullet points, I think, start to tell you a little bit of the complexity within the data. The first is that there's a lot of change in our, uh, in, in our mortality, and, and, and thankfully uh, a change for the, for the better. It's only a lot of our profession is only you know, 50 and 60 years old um, because we're seeing uh, patients that are surviving more than, than they have before. So we have, um, because of that, you'll see some, uh, a lot of practice variation or a lot of um, a lot of differences amongst institutions and uh, within our population. I think it was just around 2000 or 2001 that the adult population with CHD surpassed that number of children. So in other words, it's still a rel it's a it's a growing population that we have um, uh, within uh, within the U.S. But it's actually relatively new as well. Um, so if those are our larger population numbers, um, what's, what's important to think about is that these are anatomical defects of which you have many uh, within the heart. In other words, there's not just a, uh, it's not just a, a heart problem and anyone knows that. You have multiple, uh, multiple defects. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the numbers I, I put up here. Um, so this starts to tell you, even though we have a, a, wide, um, a wide population, we actually have um, a very striated um, population where we have a lot of um, some very specific um, diagnoses. Um, and then we also have some very, uh, a very long list of procedures that go along with those diagnoses. One of the, uh, the nomenclature standards that we have in the cardiac uh, world is, is what we call IPCCC, um, International Pediatric and Congenital Cardiac Code. That has uh, approximately uh, 200 uh, nomenclature terms as part of the short list for diagnosis, many thousands in the, that are in the long list, and approximately 300 or so um, procedures. So that gives you a, a little bit of flavor about how we think about our, our, our data gets, um, or how our population gets, you know, somewhat segmented. So if we if we do some of that math, we can, you know, we can extrapolate that to. Um, we'll take a look at this one particular population. So we have approximately thirty to forty thousand diagnoses each year. Of that, let's just look at the. Um, our um, HLHS patients, so we have approximately four to eight percent are born with CHD, have HLHS. We have approximately, or, or we have 120 centers in the U.S. that perform heart surgery. So when you think about that, and when you think about what the what the the surgical treatment is for these patients, these these patients most commonly have a three stage series of of surgeries across their uh, their young life. They tend to have the, uh, the the approximate age distribution is surgery at birth, approximately four to six months of age, and then your stage three is approximately three to five year. Um, I, I, ideally, um, I, you know, many of our kids are making it through this pathway. Um, some are not. Some are ending up on heart transplant. And within this complex disease, we still have somewhat of a, of a high mortality rate. So um, another thing that looks at the newness of um, some of our surgical outcomes is this last sentence here. It says three stages were developed in the early 1980s with no survivors uh, prior to that time. So you can see, again, we've got a lot of, um, a, a lot of change in how we're, how we're thinking about our patients because of our, um, because of our, our profession. Um, down on the bottom here included, um, so uh, if you look at this patient population and you look at, at, at an institution like CHOP that has a fairly high volume, 
Um, but you, you, when, you, when you look at the even top that has a high volume, you see we still have some fairly low numbers of, of seeing this patient population. So here's some of our, uh, our volume and our, our mortality rate um, for the last couple of years for stage one surgery. Um, at CHOP, and unfortunately, or, or even though the CHOP does have extremely good and, and low mortality rate across our population, these are still um, somewhat high because of the complexity and because of the, the, the sickness of these patients. So that's in thinking about, um, you need to think about uh, the data type or the, or the patient type and, and as you're thinking about where to put your data or how your data, um, you know, the questions that you might you might have um, uh, for your databases. Some of the other things that we start to, that we think about is we, we see some trends in cardiac medicine, and, and I just listed here a few of the trends that we see that have some uh, particular aspects or some uh, influence upon how we think about our data. Um, a lot of practice variation within and across heart centers. Um, for, for many of our patients, we're, we're just now looking at morbidities and co comorbidities um, because, again, our mortality rates um, are, are less of an indicator of how these kids are doing because, thankfully, they're, uh, they're lower t uh, today. Um, many of our patients are uh, having long-term outcomes um, that, are, that are certainly new to them, but they're also new to us because we haven't, um, we haven't always looked for those. Um, as you can imagine, for our adult cardiologist that's used to seeing um, acquired heart disease now has an increased population where they're seeing these, uh, these congenital problems that they've never seen before. Uh, you've got a lot of, uh, of multi-specialty care within the cardiac programs now, so we're looking at neurodevelopment, we're looking at growth. Um, you have a lot of uh, uh, cohort-based look at our, our patient populations, and, and then you have a lot of, um, and because of the nature of uh, uh, the, the disease process and the, the treatment of our patients, you've got a lot of uh, continuum of care. Um, and because of the distribution of our data, you have a, a, a very big need for multi-institutional uh, sharing of data or looking at, at combination of outcomes. Even somebody like CHOP or Children's Boston still has um, some small numbers in order to get you know, statistical significance, in order to get uh, the outcomes that we need. So now let me just spend a, a couple of slides um, taking a look at, at, at what the cardiac center is. I know for those that, that, that aren't in the cardiac center, you're probably uh, wondering, still like me after two and a half years, what the hell is the cardiac center? Um, we, have, um, <laughs> we have a lot going on. That's, that's the answer. I don't, I don't know what all goes on, but it's a lot. Um, so we have over 500 staff or so um, that are part of what, to me, we call ourselves a service line. To me, it kind of looks like a hospital within a hospital. Um, we have a lot of outpatient clinics. We've got subspecialty clinics. We've got a lot of diagnostic labs, inpatient units. Um, I've got OR and procedure units and a lot of multi-specialty uh, clinical programs. So we've got essentially a hospital within a hospital. Um, about 50-something beds that are for um, the cardiac ICU as well as our step-down unit. We've got another 13 beds as part of our procedural recovery unit. We've got five OR rooms, two are dedicated OR, two are for cath, one is a hybrid room. Approximately 800 plus uh, surgeries per year, about 1,000 plus um, cath and, and EP procedures. Um, our, we have clinics um, here at Maine Hospital as well as across um, specialty care centers, um, about 30,000 plus um, clinic visits per year. Um, a lot of modalities, a lot of diagnostic labs. We do over 25,000 EKGs, uh, a lot of Holter and, and, and telephonic uh, monitoring, about 20,000 echoes per year, exercise stress test, and MRI. So, we, again, we have a, a lot going on. Um, unfortunately, we also have a, a lot going on under information technology. Um, this is a, a rather busy slide. I think there's probably only a couple of things that I'll, I'll just highlight here. Um, one is that all these items that are, um, that are to your left and, and, and in green, or uh, is here a little, bit, uh, a little bit different shade of pea green, um, are um, those elements that are cardiac center systems. Um, on the right-hand side are those elements of the, the hospital or enterprise-wide um, uh, systems that, that, we tend to be, um, that we tend to be in from a cardiac center perspective. Um, a couple of the takeaways are, are the things that have some meaning for us from a, uh, from a, a data sensibility. Um, 
is one that Epic is not yet in the center of our universe. In fact, it's, it's still on the outside of what we do in the cardiac center. And, and we need to work on changes for that until we embrace that or until we get some better fixes for that. Um, we're going to have some problems. Um, another thing to, uh, to take away is even though in, in this diagram I put some lines, um, some downstream interfaces that we get from, um, from Epic, those are just patient demographics and ADT feeds that are coming down. Um, there's not a good data flow in here. There's just a, this is just the way that we're doing document management. And so um, it's not that this is a, 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 a great solution and it's in planned or it, that it was planned and in place, but it's, it's, it's what is in place and what we need to deal with. So some of the things that we are dealing with is something that looks like this to me. We, yeah, we've got lots of information technology. We just don't have any information. We don't, and, and likewise, it's hard to get a, a good handle on that data that, that gets us that information. So some of the challenges that we've seen, um, and again, I'll just highlight some of the, uh, some of the things within uh, you know, how we think about our, our, our data collection. We're just pushing around a lot of documents. We don't yet have a lot of data, spe spe specifically for data that we can use for uh, you know, looking at outcomes or to use for research or other secondary use purposes. Um, it, we have no, because we have so many isolated systems and not yet shared nomenclatures or not yet um, you know, ways of, of looking at patient cohorts across our systems. We've got some problems with actually identifying, well, who's a cardiac patient and where's our, where's our patient cohorts. Um, as I alluded to in the beginning about the, uh, you know, our profession is also new in looking at a lot of clinical outcomes. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of questions about, well, what data do we need? Well, what's the questions we need to ask our database? Um, and, and, and we're still working on a lot of those questions yet. So we don't yet, um, you know, have some of that data because we don't yet know the, the questions that we're asking. Um, we also have, and so we have this large population, but yet we have it, um, you know, very shallow um, patient cohorts. So those are some of the, the challenge that we've had in place, um, you know, for many years. So, um, you know, you have, you have these whole mess of problems. What, what do you do with these problems? So for those, are there any um, Tarantino fans in the audience? Um, so um, here's a, a humorous little little clip here. Everyone should know this, right? <laughs> your Jimmy, right? This is your house. Sure. How much the wolf? Problems. Good. Yeah. So I heard. Now come in. Uh, yeah, you see. <laughs> so as you know, Tony alluded to about my you know my many many roles that I've had in a cardiac center. I'm often you know wondering I should maybe change my my business card. I, it's Ken McCardle Cardiac Center. I solve problems. Um, we we certainly need um, you know somebody like that that who can uh, you know address uh, address what we have. Of course, another um, for those that know the movie, you'll probably know it's it's actually hard to uh, get a twenty or thirty minute clip that's actually um, uh, PG format. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, let's jump let's jump into um, what it looks like for uh, for 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 data governance. So. Um, We've been doing data governance, I guess for, um, I don't know, in some sort of formal way, I guess we've been doing data governance for almost a year now, where we have this committee that we have in place um, in the Cardiac Center, and we got real formal, and we wrote, um, you, you know, we have, uh, we have members, we have about 10 or 12 clinicians, a handful of RNs, a couple of administrative staff. Um, we developed a charter, we said we were gonna do all these things. Um, and uh, you know we meet on a regular basis, and we're actually um, we're actually doing some things, and um, it's it's a good group. Um, so instead of read through all those uh, all those things, let me just focus on um, a handful of what I think are, are sort of some uh, some foundation level things that we've done, and and um, uh, I'd like to walk through these in, in future slides on on here's some of the things that we're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Um, 
So we're answering some of these basic questions about, um, you know, why, what do we want from our data? Why are we doing these things? And so, um, you know, as I talk to uh, many clinicians, almost every answer that you get about, well, what data do you want or why are we doing this? And everyone says, well, we want all data, all patients, and we want to do everything with the data. And so we look to this data governance group and say, well, yeah, that's the case. Everybody wants secondary use data and everybody wants everything, but what, what, what are specific questions that we can ask, ask our data? Um, and so we came up, um, we, so we focused ourselves and said, let's look at clinical outcomes, let's come up with some questions, and let's make sure that we had the data to answer those questions. So that was our focus on why are we doing these efforts and, and, and help us to focus on how we manage these efforts. So then in thinking about the content or the, or the what, um, so what we came up with, instead of saying, you know, okay, all data and all systems and all people, we said, let's develop a minimum data set. In other words, let's get something that we can actually handle. Um, let's develop, we'll develop a data dictionary that says clearly here's what we're doing. Um, you know, from a data collection sensibility, we have definitions attached to everything. Um, and we're really going to focus on the, the, the data quality of that, of that minimum data set. Um, so then taking that a little further, we said, okay, if that's the, if that's the rules, um, then where are we going to apply that to? And so we came up with the, uh, what we called phase one, um, which is largely our first sort of year of implementation. We said, well, let's focus on our clinical data registry um, and a couple of areas where we have patient cohorts. Um, and we did that for a couple reasons, and I'll, I'll go into a couple of slides and tell you a little bit more about that. But so we called, that was our first phase. Um, we have a process for saying, okay, well, what, where do we want to go um, and, and when? So we use the data governance as, as helping us with a, a prioritized work efforts. Um, and then we also work with the data governance committee for helping us with the um, with answering the people um, questions. And so we define roles and responsibilities and um, who's, um, who's doing what. So let's start at the beginning. Why, why, are we, why are we looking at our data and what are some of the questions that we're asking? Um, and so um, we came up with some very specific reasons. Um, we came, and so the, the process that we had for coming up with uh, these questions were that the, the data governance uh, committee tasked me with going around and meeting with each of our, our, our service area or each of our CQI activities and, uh, you know, across the cardiac center and said, let's get very specific on what outcomes we're going to measure. Um, so I went around, after I went around to a, a few people, I came up with something of a template. A template is on your, your left-hand side where, to me, it looked like we had, you know, we had uh, areas, uh, you know, service areas where uh, where this outcome came from. We had a we had category and description, patient cohort. Um, we uh, we articulated where's the data source for that data element. What's the calculation? The numerator, denominator. Does it come from a registry? Who's the data manager? Is this a national benchmark? And and, and so on. And we went across our areas, and we, we we focused on a couple of areas. And again, we focused on the areas where we could actually do something, or we we captured or we did some areas where that that had a close alignment to our registry. Um, so here's just an example of. Uh, of working with uh, CT surgery, we have about 20 or 25 um, outcomes, and so we, uh, you know, we went through and, and clearly defined them and articulated where does that data come from, how long has CHOP had that data, and and, and so on. So that was a, a very good, um, a very good effort for us. It's an uh, it's an ongoing effort. We have we developed a model that we now scale across the cardiac center. Um, I think we have maybe 50-ish um, clinical outcomes that we've uh, that we've defined, um, and we're now starting to bring out some of that data. Um, we'll be having an intranet presence um, probably here in a in a few weeks, um, as well as we've been working with our. Um, with the web team for um, pushing some of these outcomes to the um, to the internet. So when thinking about um, when thinking further about some of these outcomes, and then thinking further about some of the data, a lot of our data comes from these data registries. 
Um, and so we, we saw that it is a good place to go ahead and start um, with our data management program and to make sure that we have roles and responsibilities to assign uh, that are assigned throughout these, um, the, these registries. Here's a good uh, quote from the uh, chair of one of, the, one of our registries, the American College of uh, Cardiology. Science tells us what we can do, guidelines what we should do, and registries what, what we're actually doing. So for those that don't know um, data registries or what they, what they look like in the, in, in the clinical space, let me just give you um, a little bit of a, of a highlight here. So the, car the pediatric cardiac patient, we actually have a lot of registries. Um, the, the, the registries um, uh, will typically have um, uh, common data standards. Um, and in other words, there's, some of these are, uh, or most of these are vetted through uh, clinical guidelines, uh, clinical societies, uh, from uh, clinical journals, um, and, and such. And so you have standard definitions, you have mandatory data entry um, for uh, uh, many of those data elements. In other words, you can't submit when you harvest your data or when you submit your um, data to a warehouse, you can't submit null fields, you have to include answers. Um, almost, uh, you know, 90-something percent of this data is non-administrative data. Um, it's very pure, what I call high-octane clinical data, and most often that's coming directly from, uh, coming from a clinician. In our case, we sometimes have clinicians directly going to a registry database. In other cases, we have them going to, uh, going to paper. Um, uh, a registry most typically has about 100 to 200 data elements, um, and those are data elements either per case, per pr procedure, per clinic visit, per, you know, whichever is uh, applicable for that cohort. Um, Multi-institutional participation, um, so you get some benefits um, for not only looking at your own outcomes, but then how do we um, as an institution compare to our peers. Um, for example, one of our registries, the Society for Thoracic Surgeons, or STS, um, there's 122 surgical centers across the country, 98 of them are participant. Um, so every six months we get a report back from STS that plots how is CHOP doing compared uh, next to our peers. Um, many of these registries endorsed by clinical societies, and you'll often find these, uh, these registries and subsequent outcome and, and data analysis that's showing up in our, in our clinical journals. So here's, um, here's a rough sketch of uh, the cardiac center, this, these um, center items are what we see as kind of our, our inpatient procedural area uh, aspect of, of the cardiac center. On the right-hand side is our, our, our clinic and uh, some of our diagnostic labs. On the bottom, some of our, our patient cohorts or our subspecialty clinics. And then on the, the, the far left-hand side is some of our multidisciplinary or our clinic, um, clinic programs. So here's what we said was phase one in the cardiac center. And uh, yes, believe it or not, all, all those that are in red that have a little acronym on there, those are registries that exist in those, um, in those spaces. So we, we've got a ton of registries. There's not just one cardiac registry. We've got many. Um, so uh, many of these, uh, so some of these registries we actually belong to already, some of them not. Um, some of them that we do belong to, maybe we're, uh, maybe we're recording the data and not or recording the paper, not actually going to a, a local database. In other cases, we're maybe reporting to a registry, but yet we're not real good at ensuring that that's high quality data. So we're taking a renewed, in some cases, a renewed look at those registries. In other cases, we're joining registries new. Um, and so that's what we, um, that's what we identified as our phase one. Um, those um, items that are those uh, uh, orangish um, items that are there on the left, those are data collection efforts across the cohort that they, to me, they look very much like a registry. I think it's possible that what CHOP is doing is probably going to perhaps be the start of a national registry in the future. Um, and then on this far right hand side, just this different color here, I'll tell you, uh, talk to you a little bit more about what we're doing in Echo Lab. But um, we did look, outside of our registries, we are looking at um, some of our clinical systems. So our, our registries are actually turning out to be more than just a registry. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's some sort of uh, a, a very big prominence, and, and it looks like uh, a future lifespan for these um, for these efforts. 
Uh, the U.S. News and World Report for the last couple of years has been asking us about are we members of Registry X, Registry Y. Um, depending on your answer, you're then supposed to provide them with the data from table number 71 of the STS registry. In other words, it's almost becoming a quality indicator that you're actually participating in, in, in these registries. Um, our payers for the last couple of years have been asking us questions about are you members of the registry? Um, please send us the data as you reported it. Please send us the same mortality uh, ratings um, as you compared to your peers, et cetera. Um, National Quality Forum actually just recently recognized a couple of the, of the STS registry as, um, as indicators for um, part of their, their quality initiative. Um, and then again, on your, on, on your bottom right-hand side, we're also finding that these registries are helping us with peer benchmarking. In the case of, uh, of this screenshot here, it's from the STS that provides us a, um, a six-month report and plots out how is CHOP doing um, compared to our peers. So um, that answers some of the questions about why are we doing what we're doing, where are we doing it, when are we doing it, how are we doing it. Um, another thing that we answered in, in data governance is, well, who's doing this stuff? And so what we did is we went across and we said, all right, any clinical de data collection effort, whether it's you know, a data collection effort with a registry or without a registry or in a clinical system or not in a clinical system, and we defined, um, so let's define that um, patient cohort. Um, we, uh, we put together a, uh, a minimum data set for that um, data collection effort. We, have, we assigned a clinical uh, data sponsor for each of those efforts. We, ha we assigned a data manager for each of those efforts. Um, we then have, we somewhat have, and so that's what we're trying to do uh, centrally is kind of an organizational model, is that every registry or data collection effort has to have a, a you know, a sponsor and a manager associated with that. Um, but the data collectors, we still kept at what we call a federated data model. So um, these are data collectors that don't um, that don't necessarily, re that don't report to me, um, a handful of them do in a, in a couple of registries, but for the most part, these are data collectors who could be anybody. They could be surgeons, they could be clinicians, they could be RNs, they, they come from across the cardiac center. Um, and then we also have a little bit of detail about this data collection effort. How many, um, how many major cases, when did we start this effort, how many patients to date, and so on. So another of the roles that we defined is, uh, is for clinical sponsors. Um, so these are clinical sponsors within each of our areas. Again, sometimes it's, it's a registry, sometimes it's not. Um, if there's a registry or if not, um, they liaison with their own um, areas. Um, in other words, sometimes the clinical sponsor, uh, say for a cath lab, um, is also the same MD that's responsible for CQI activities in the cath lab. Um, and so um, many of our times we're finding a convergence of um, the, uh, the, the QI initiatives aligned to our data registry initiatives. Um, where there's not a, a, a uh, registry in place. We work with the clinical sponsors to define our data dictionary. Um, these are members of uh, data governance. Um, and outside of that, there's some stewardship responsibility to data collection and quality. In other words, when our data managers um, come to data collectors and find that we have missing data, um, if that uh, if we find repeatable patterns, then we go back to clinical sponsors and ask them to go out and champion or go out and um, you know, enforce some of our, of our rules in our data collection process. We actually, um, we also find that there's other roles outside of, um, outside of CHOP. Um, many, of, um, many of our clinical sponsors are also on national boards for uh, some of these registries or some of our, uh, the IPC. Uh, uh, we have a, um, a clinician from CHOP that's actually on, on boards there. Um, um, I, I'm on a couple of these boards as well as some senior clinicians on, on um, one, of our, uh, uh, one of our task force that uh, should be uh, bringing out a white paper here soon um, for the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association is developing a uh, white paper for the key data elements that are applicable to the pediatric and congenital heart disease patient. Um, we also have a new, um, a, a new consortium that uh, looks like it's going to be um, uh, fairly important for the, uh, for the cardiac space. It actually started out as a, a clinical and translational science award. Um, it's this PC4 that I have a, uh, an icon for and over on the left-hand side. They're looking at quality measures and, um, and helping out with research collaborations. So um, 
this slide here, let me, let me just walk through this, um, this with you. This is what we're seeing um, kind of the, uh, you know, what I see is kind of the, sh the shareability or the, you know, the data model for what's happening with our, our, our data registry. So let's just say there's, a, there's one of our data registry you have in this center sphere. Um, and I'll start on the right hand, upper right-hand side. So sometimes what you see across multi-institutions, you have, um, so beyond a clinical data registry where multi-institutions are joining, you're finding something like that PC, PC4 effort that I, um, that I alluded to um, that is allowing um, a, a subset of members to start a QI initiative or a research initiative within that registry. In other words, the registry has a minimum data set and a mandatory data set, but a handful of institutions can then add on more, ele more data elements within that registry and then can do some quality indicators amongst that smallest group. Um, so you're seeing that model is happening. Um, when that occurs, you don't uh, uh, then need your, your, your MRN or your renewed keys because you're managing yourself within that registry. Um, on the bottom right-hand side is, a, is another model that's taking place. Um, IPCCC is, is, uh, is often the controlled or standard nomenclature across many of these registries. Um, we're finding that these um, these, uh, many of these registries are getting away from ICD-9 coding and going towards um, uh, this vocabulary that makes it uh, certainly uh, better and easier for us to uh, be able to share data across our registries. Um, on, the, on the lower right hand, or I'm sorry, left hand corner, um, this is within CHOP um, where we're seeing that we're often building our clinical data registry, um, our, our cohort um, within that registry, but then we can, uh, we can mash it up with our, our clinical systems data. Um, and then on the upper left hand side, um, there's been some examples and some uh, scenarios where we've taken um, on an external basis, taken the, uh, some of these data registries and mashed them up with uh, administrative data, FIS data, um, EHR data. So that's, um, that's where we're seeing some of those um, data registries and how they're helping us with shareability across organizations. So now let me jump into, um, let me jump into uh, data management. Um, first, let me give you, so I'll give you the, uh, the official definition, and then let me give you the Dilbert um, real definition. Um, so data management, development, execution, supervision of plans, policies, programs, practices, control, protect, deliver, enhance the value of data and information assets. So in other words, best practices for data management. Um, here's, a good, um, here's a good Dilbert. Can you guys read that? Is it okay to um, see? Um, so, of course, the, the key tagline here is, is Dilbert says, the best way to compile inaccurate information that no one wants is to make it up. Well, so we don't want to do that. We want, we want, we want best practices. Um, so, um, so like data governance, um, for data management, we put, um, we put together uh, roles and responsibilities. We put together job descriptions. We put together, uh, you know, practices. We identified best practices either from our own proven methodology or, 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 or looking at our outside peers. Um, we put together a number of things that we put in place. So let me walk through um, some of these things that we put in place. Um, so with some help with uh, uh, the good folks at the CBMI, we um, put together this tool, um, which is a, uh, where we put together, uh, or where we mash up our data dictionary. Um, so for each of our, our data registries or each of our clinical data systems, we can then put it into this uh, data, uh, uh, data dictionary format. So we can see how does you know, 100 data elements here mash up the uh, relate to 100 data elements here, to 100 data elements here. Um, that's where we can include data definitions or meta metadata. We can identify source of truth. Um, so it's a good tool for us to be able to see data as it goes across all of our registries and all of our systems. Um, it helps us to, um, to look at gaps, where we have daps, gaps in data collection. Um, in other words, where we have, where we're missing um, you know, particular data elements within a cohort. It, help, it helps us to look at where we have redundancies in our data. In other words, we can use it for where do we have overlaps in data sets. Uh, it shows us where we don't have, where we're missing common uh, modifiers or, or values within, uh, within our data. Um, 
It's a place where we can see, do we have national standards? Um, are we lacking source of truth? And what we see is the, the foundation for, uh, you know, how do we get our data out to future of data warehousing, future analytics? So another tool that um, we worked with um, CBMI and, and they put together for us is um, uh, something of a data query thingamajig or data bobber thing. Um, and what it does is um, it, it has a couple of purposes for us. Um, initially, we found that it's a good place to get visualize of, uh, a visualization of data that we don't yet um, uh, have access to in some of our clinical systems. In other words, uh, within our cath lab, within our echo, um, very important data for uh, many people for many reasons, um, but yet we have some problems in, um, in, in getting that data out. We put together this tool and it helps us do a couple things. One is that, you know, it's a query tool that we can now get access to it, um, but it also helps us get a, a better understanding of our data. It's a quick way of visualizing, while well, we don't just have outliers of our data, but we have a lot of missing data or we have a lot of missing um, uh, 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 gap, or we have a lot of gaps within our, our data collection. So we put together a you know a handful of things. Um, an another Dilbert cartoon for you here. Um, again, the, the tagline: Do I have permission to fake the data? The boss says I didn't even know data can be real. Um, for for us, um, you know, the reality is is that we do have a lot of data out there. Again, it, it seems to be contained in a lot of these documents. Um, but what we're doing is we have data management. Um, we, we're going out and doing some 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 auditing. We sometimes have some external auditing of our registries. Um, we're finding that we're able to mash up our data across registries to help um, ensure uh, QA uh, across. And we're also using our clinical systems to also balance um, our, our registries. Um, because we have a lot of data redundancy, we're always looking to uh, identifying the source of truth and then make sure that, that is, um, that's your quality control. Our data managers run data reports for, uh, for missing data um, and uh, a lot of other such. So um, let me just focus um, here on some of the data management work that we're doing in our clinical systems. So um, to the right-hand side of your screen, this is a, a template that's used in the, uh, the, the, the Echo Lab. So this is essentially a structured data uh, report. So clinicians are going through a pick list, um, and on the left-hand side is they're seeing the results of every time they click in a database, it's, it's writing out in English how to write that report. Um, we did that uh, structured data report back in August 2009. Um, a lot of goods, um, uh, a lot of benefits to that. Um, a couple negatives. Um, overwhelmingly, it's, um, it's good for us. Um, we're producing a much better report um, for uh, referring physicians and cardiologists. Some of the challenges that we're still having is that it's a lot of data for clinicians and we're still seeing a lot of variability amongst clinicians. There's, within the ECHO lab, there's many thousands of measurements, um, you know, DICOM measurements, uh, calculations ratios, et cetera. Um, within this template, um, there's multiple tabs, mo multiple places where clinicians are going. There's over 1,600 observations that um, clinicians can make. Um, the model that we have in the Echo Lab is that on any given day, there's probably three or four reading um, MDs. Um, overall, there's probably 20, 22 MDs that are reading. Um, and then you've got 10 plus sonographers. So what we did is we, um, we put in place, so beyond the structured data report, we put in place some uh, protocols. Um, we now have about, um, about 10 or 12 protocols across the cardiac center. So instead of a, a cardiologist asking a particular question, um, they can still do that, but then we also say, what is the, pro what is, what is the protocol that you want? Um, in this case, they tell us pulmonary hypertension, and then sonographer knows what images to grab, what measurements to grab. The reading MD also says, all right, this is what I need to look for, this is what I need to make comments on. And then because we're able to do that, we're then able to better look at across our cohort so we can take this data out. In this case, you know, we can jam it into Excel or, or Access or wherever to take a look at secondary use data. Um, and um, we can see that we've got better patterns. We don't have a lot of missing gaps um, of data. And where we do have missing gaps, that's where we can apply our data, data managers can say, all right, do we have variability uh, with a certain doctor or a certain day of the week or a certain protocol? Um, 
Another thing that we did, so even though we have many thousands of, of data elements, and even though everyone in Echolab tells us all 20,000 are important, um, the reality is, is we found that only about two or 300 are like really important. Um, and so what we found is, um, on the right hand side, is some of the existence of where that data exists within a protocol. Um, and so as we did that, we essentially built a minimum data set for each protocol. As we add them all together, our full, so each protocol may be 30, 40, 50 elements, but when you add them all up, we actually only have about two or 300 data elements that are, um, that are across that. So that makes it a lot more manageable for data managers. Instead of saying thousands, you're saying 300 didn't go out and look for them. Um, so one of the big places um, for us um, of, of, of satisfying our, our, our clinical systems and getting this data out from the Echo Lab um, is within our, our interstage um, monitoring program. So we have this new program in the cardiac center. It's looking at, um, so these are our HLHS patients, um, and we're particularly looking at between stage one and stage two. Um, so again, somewhere between birth and four to six months of age, and we wanna make sure they're doing well and they make it to stage two. So we're taking a very hard look um, these kids have hospitalization throughout their three surgeries. Um, within their particular two, um, we're making sure that they have, uh, we're giving them an echo every week, and we're now going to be following, um, such we created a stage one protocol, so that we have a baseline and then we can see how they're doing, so we can start to trend them. The complexity for, for us in a data management sensibility is there's a ton of registries across this space. So each of these surgeries have a registry. Um, if the kid goes bad and we need to put them on life, uh, on life support, we need to put them in an ECMO registry. If they go really bad, we need to replace the heart. They're in a donor registry. Each of their hospitalizations are in a registry. And then to make that even more complex, um, that that particular cohort actually happens to be in, an, in a national cohort um, to look at how, do, how does the interstage program at CHOP compare to other institutions? So there's actually a registry of registry just for these cohorts. And the, the amazing thing, or one of the amazing things that I think about this, is this is for 30 to 40 patients at CHOP. And look at, look at the amazing amount of data and...